Hello and welcome to the January webinar from the IEA Clean Coal Centre. My name is Dr. Leslie Sloss and I'm a Principal Environment Consultant with the Centre. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from the website on the screen there. That's www.iea-coal.org. Residents of our member countries and employees of sponsoring organisations can download the reports, uh, no charge, one click um, download as a PDF after a one-off registration on the website. That's just a login with an email and a password. If you're not a member country or a member sponsor organisation, you can still log in and you can download some of our older uh, material and you can still have access to all the webinars and information on our conferences. So please do visit the website, it is a wealth of information there for you. Today I'm going to be talking about the emerging markets for pollution control retrofits. Um, this was a report that was produced and sent out in draft for peer review just before Christmas. I have been working through the comments which were quite extensive um, and so we expect this to be published in a final form within the next uh, month or so. If you have any questions during this talk, I appreciate I tend to speak quite quickly and I'll be covering quite a lot of material. Please do uh, fill in a question in the online uh, box there and as much as possible I will try to answer these at the end. If I don't, do not panic. I am very good at replying to emails and so please do email me with any questions you have. Now this report was produced in response to some requests from our executive members who wanted to know more about the, the movement from technologies into the marketplace. We've done a lot of reports previously on control technologies. As I say, go to the website, there's um, hundreds of reports there. But people want to, to know about actually selling these and getting them into um, coal-fired power plants in response to legislation and policy. And so this is what I plan to do within the report. What I must say before I give this presentation is at the end I will be giving a little bit of marketing information, um, a little bit of guidance on where sales might be potentially appearing in emerging markets. Now I must stress that this is transient information based on current policy and activities that I've seen in a literature review over the last three months. So while it might be relevant just now, it's not going to be relevant forever. This is transient information. For a country such as Indonesia, the plans for um, expansion into coal, um, new coal-fired power plants may not be set in stone, as we know from the last 2016 uh, volatile year in terms of voting patterns and the changes in policies. Things can change very swiftly. So what I'm hoping is this report will give you an idea of the things to look for and the factors to consider when um, trying to assess a market while not actually defining those markets for you. Um, if you do want more specific information for a specific um, product you have or a specific market you're interested in, there is a potential for us perhaps to do a private report for you on a commission type basis. Um, this would need to be discussed with our um, director. Um, you can email me and we can discuss that further. Anyway, what are the markets and how do you get involved? Well, many people assume that emission legislation defines the market and that is quite a big mistake to make. Just because there's an emission limit for sulfur dioxide, which would imply that a sulfur dioxide control technology is required, doesn't mean to say that's going to happen. Take, for example, the UK. Uh, let's assume Brexit's not happening. That wouldn't that be lovely? Um, like the UK must adopt the legislation coming out of the European Commission. So, for example, the Industrial Emissions Directive, um, which um, is, has impending uh, emission limits for mercury. Now, as a member country of the European Union, the UK would have to adopt this into national legislation, would have to set emission limits for mercury for the coal-fired power plants. Now, anyone looking at this would think, OK, good, there's now going to be a market for maybe five, six coal mercury uh, installations in, in the UK. However, policy is more important. And currently, the UK policy is to close all coal-fired power plants by 2025. So if any coal-fired power plants are going to be installing mercury controls, they're going to be doing it on a very cheap and transient and short-term situation. So that's what I mean when I say that policy is more important than legislation. The t selection process for the technology that's going to be going into any particular market is very complicated. In many situations, um, utilities are going to be looking for the lowest cost option and the simplest options just to get things in there to comply and to carry on producing power. 
However, there are some forward-thinking plants out there who will want to future-proof themselves. Maybe bear in mind that legislation will be tightening in future, and so we'll be prepared to spend a little bit more on perhaps a multi-pollutant control system to ensure that they are ready to run uh, for the foreseeable future. And finally, just because there is a forward-thinking plant manager or a plant manager is looking for a technology um, to comply with legislation and you have a technology that will work for them, it's not always a situation the two of you will meet on a level playing field. And we'll discuss the different factors that will affect that um, slightly later on in this talk. The report itself is broken up into three main sections. First, I deal with the pollution control technologies. Now, this is um, information taken from our myriad of reports on this subject. So it's quite a good summary document for you if you want to have a quick overview of FGD and DNOC systems. Um, and it also feeds you back to the original reports so if you need more detail from them. I then look at the factors uh, affecting the technology selection, why people choose the systems that they do. And then I try to pick on some international market and national case studies. And I stress again, this is sort of transient type information, so don't um, call back on it too much. Don't use it as a prescription. Uh, as I was doing the literature search for this report, I did note that there were quite a few reports you could buy for control systems, sort of emerging markets around the world. And these seem to cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Now, obviously, um, I wasn't prepared to pay that myself, so I've got no idea what's in there. But I'm assuming that the information in this report is the kind of information that these uh, projects and reports are based on. So hopefully, um, when you leave at the end of this session, there'll be a little bit of information out there that will help you decide for yourself where your emerging market may be. The report tried to take into account the perspectives from the different people involved in legislation and emission control. You've got the regulators and the authorities who obviously want to reduce emissions that are affecting the health of the public around them. In some situations, you have um, legislation being set that maintains the status quo so that coal power can still be part of the mix, but that coal power has to be clean as possible. And then you've got the kind of policy type situation where the legislation may be being tightened to the point where the coal is helping to either leave the marketplace or make some sort of transitionary technology leap into a zero emission heli technology. So there's a kind of mix there between are we cleaning up the plants that we have or are we simply forcing them to close? Coal fire plant, plant operators themselves obviously wish to keep producing money. A lot of them are more than aware that they're an important part of the energy mix and that they're going to be allowed to derogate in certain situations when the legislation has been shown to be too tight. But they're still going to be doing so at the lowest cost to them because they have a shorter payback period to make back the money that they've invested in these pollution control systems. And then finally, on the outside, you've got the equipment suppliers who are sitting there ready to provide the, um, the technologies for the compliance situation and just making sure that they know how best to get into that marketplace and to get their uh, solution out to the people that need it. So this is a kind of summary of what's in Chapter 3. I'm not going to take you through it in detail. As I say, it's based on the numerous quality reports from the Clean Coal Centre. There are lots of different options for SOX, NOx, particulate and control. And the technology chosen has to be appropriate for your plant configuration, your coal type and so on. And a plant manager really has quite a task to decide which system is going to be best for him. He's going to have to look at the legislation, which is going to be a emission limit or a reduction target. And he's going to have to work back sort of mathematically and economically to see what will have to be applied on his particular plant to achieve that emission control or reduction. And obviously, he's going to be looking at cost as well. So, okay, bag houses and ESP systems both control particulate emissions, but each has pros and cons. Bag houses may be more suitable for low sulfur coals, but they may be more expensive than ESPs. But they take up less space than an ESP, but they do require more regular maintenance but then they can act as multi-pollutant control systems. And so you've kind of got this head-bobbing scenario going back and forth between the two systems, trying to decide which is best for your situation. And it gets even more complicated when you move downstream towards flue gas desulfurization. Are you going wet FGD, dry systems? Wet FGD systems are more popular. Um, low, uh, sorry, dry FGD systems are often better for low, lower sulfur coals. There are different matrices, as I show, there to be taken into account. 
different coals leave different low NOx burners. And we even have produced at the Clean Coal Centre with the help of the United Nations a little matrix to take you through a decision tree and a calculation tool for mercury control, trying to guess which is best for your plant. One thing I will say for these situations is that most of the information out there is based on what I would call standard control technologies, you know, an FGD for for, uh, for sulphur and uh, an SCR for NOx. Whereas these days there are some very exciting emerging technologies coming onto the marketplace that can control more than one system at once. I'm not going to mention them um, one by one because that would be um, preferential. We don't do that. But there is a list within the report, uh, a table which summarizes some of the more exciting technologies being developed out there and where they are in terms of pilot or full scale. And what we would hope to see is more of those being demonstrated at pilot and full scale to get them in because they offer an advantage of being modular, smaller, potentially more suitable for emerging economies who would, rather than bolting on several systems uh, in series one by one, could benefit from bolting on a technology that does more than one job at the one time and potentially at a lower cost. So for the plant manager, there's a kind of decision process to go through. This is a decision tree produced for um, FTD systems, but it applies to almost anything. A plant manager is going to be looking at how much it's going to cost them to put it in there, and then how much is it going to cost to keep it running um, for the rest of that plant lifetime. He's going to be looking to see that it ensures the removal he requires for compliance, that it's going to do so reliably, and that he can actually fit it on his plant. Now, space requirements are something that we often forget about, but in some of these emerging economies, Older plants have been built in highly populated areas and they simply don't have the space to add on an FTD system or so on. And so you're talking about considering modular additions or some building up more horizontally than vertically to achieve that control. Some of these plants won't have access to water or water is going to be expensive for them. That has to be taken into account. So finally, you will be going to the commercial supplier and you'll be looking at... Um, Trying to find a supplier that you regard as reliable, proven technology has a guarantee. Now, if you're after an FTD system, there are plenty out there. If you're going for some more emerging technology, then you're going to have to work with a, a developing supplier on a sort of shared um, risk basis, as it were. They can't give you a guarantee. They don't, haven't proven their technology yet, but their technology may be very appropriate for you. So you have to work up some sort of system whereby you give them a chance and they can eventually get themselves one step further up the ladder into being a proven technology for commercial sales. So for the plant operator, there's this decision tree to work through. Do I need to install the controls? And then do I really, really need to install the controls? I mean, legislation is there, but there's often ways around it. You can derogate, you can delay, maybe there's a trading system. If you're an older plant, there's grandfathering, that's when, when you kind of delay um, closing your bank completely and you offer to run for a certain number of hours a year so that you're fitting in within an emission reduction target for the whole region but you yourself are allowed to run for a limited number of hours to keep going. Who's paying for it? Obviously if somebody else is paying then the whole thing changes and that's quite important. China as of this year is trying new tariffs for cleaner plants and I'll talk about more of this later. But the idea being that if you are a cleaner plant, you get paid more for your coal and therefore you can pay off the loans or, or you've got a return on your investment for your clean tech. While this is great, you have to be very careful with these because you don't want the situation whereby because this energy from the, this plant is now more expensive effectively that people then turn to the dirtier plants for the cheaper energy. There has to be fairness across the tariff and it has to be worked well. So it'll be interesting to see now how that works out for China. But it could be a very good way of making sure that plants want to invest and know that they're going to get a return for that investment. Then, of course, we have the technology issues that we've discussed um, in Chapter 3. That's what's the best system for my specific coal. Is it actually going to work in my plant? Do I have space for it? How do I make an informed choice? I mean, unless you're part of a big um, utility company, you may be making a decision based on who you know that has a plan that's similar to yours, similar calls. Is there anybody else that has a similar call? At the moment, we have Germany considering mercury control for lignite plants. They're looking at the American situation where mercury control has been achieved, but the lignites are very different and the plants are very different. So is it applicable? Where are they going to get the information before they start spending their money? 
And where can they get it from? If I were to step outside the door in the USA and ask for information on a combined technology for sulfur and mercury control, for example, there are probably several suppliers right around the corner that could supply to me and would have information on similar plants where they had demonstrated. If I were to step outside the door in India, on the other hand, and ask for information on FTD systems for high ash coals, very few and even fewer in, in uh, India, as far as I'm aware, there are no FTD manufacturers and only one or two uh, suppliers feeding FTD systems into India. And so there's this situation where in some areas there's plenty of choice and in others there's very limited choice. So the summary of what I've said so far before we move on to the countries is that legislation doesn't equate to market potential and the market capacity doesn't equate to market potential. And the national market, just because China may have to buy some materials, doesn't mean to say it's necessarily going to buy it from the international market. And there is no in national, or in, sorry, no level international playing field for these sales. You have to consider the legislation and the policy in each of the different regions. The plant age issues, as I've said, you're not going to invest in an older plant unless you know you're going to get return on that investment. You've got geographical considerations. Regional policies um, although some countries in Asia don't have emission limits, there are countries in that area that share the same air shed and are therefore working together to reduce emissions. And so there may not be a local uh, legislation for sulfur in that region, but there may be plants being installed with control systems due to benefits given from uh, surrounding and neighbouring countries. You've also got the geographical region considerations of the availability of skill set, materials, the political situation in that region, um, all these local issues that are going to come up. Funding, there are regional biases, there's certainly some national favouritism. There are market mechanisms, as I said, the Chinese in building its, its own one, but there's also some international issues that have to be addressed. The um, ITA, which I think is the International Trade Association, says that um, tariffs remain a substantial and limiting barrier to trade in environmental technologies. And what they say is that import tariffs can add as much as 20% to the costs of importing materials into some countries, which obviously makes any import prohibitively more expensive than any product produced um, at home. And that has to be considered. There are agencies that will, such as the ITA who will work with you to try and get through these barriers, to set up national and international dialogues, provide help with financial vehicles and project development. And they will help. But there's always going to be that kind of um, produced at home or not produced at home. And countries such as China and India actually have build at home priorities where they don't deny the fact that they will preferentially give um, projects to those that are producing these materials at home on a national basis. Now, Japan is actually a good example of a country that's established environmental centres in other regions to promote um, financial uh, uh, movement, uh, but to promote advances in pollution control. The Japanese Agenda 21 has centres in China, Thailand and Indonesia. Now, these are providing technical assistance and help with policy dialogue so that they can help with people determining best policy and legislative approaches to reduce emissions. But they're also providing funding, the ISET, that's the International Centre for Environmental Technology and Transfer out of Japan, which was established in the 1990s to provide 4.7 yen, that's about uh, 47 million US dollars, to transfer industrial environmental technology to developing countries. So what we have there is Japan setting up this this movement of funds and expertise into these areas to provide them with what they need, but also it has that kind of leverage in that it's promoting Japanese materials and Japanese equipments, giving the Japanese a bit of a feedback on their investment, obviously, um, and promoting Japanese situation. Now, presumably, um, the USA and other countries have these kind of situations as well, but Japanese seem to be the most forward thinking. JCO um, has a memorandum of understanding with the Central Electricity Authority in India. And so they're working together already on the production of cleaner power in the country. And as I'll talk about later, India is one of the real places where investment could be about to happen. And so Japan has been forward enough thinking and has got itself in the foot in the jaw already. And then there are intellectual property issues, as there are in any situation. Some countries have more respect for, for patents than others, and this is going to be the way uh, for quite a time to come. And you have to make sure that you have someone 
naturally working on your side or you may well be at a disadvantage on that side of things. So let's just put this into theory so it's easier to understand. Let's consider a country called Cobania. Now, Cobania does not exist. Um, it's just there in my imagination. It's a small country, um, sort of um, just outside the EU, so it's not involved in the directives or anything yet, possibly fairly close to Russia. It's growing. It's got 100 coal fire power plants. It's a lot bigger than you think it would be. I'm surprised we haven't heard of it. But it's just ratified the Minamata Convention. So that means that it's going to need 100 mercury control systems. And since I've just invented the mercury begone system, I am going to make a fortune selling this into Colbania. But as we've discussed, it doesn't work like that. Some plants are going to be excluded. They may be peaking plants, co-firing systems. They may be just simply be excluded from legislation, um, derogations or so on. They may be grandfathering due to their age. They may be planning to close over the longer term. And even the remaining plants won't all walk into my marketplace with the same objective. Some of them may be gasification plants, FG, FBC systems, co-firing systems, for which standard control technologies are not going to be appropriate. Others are going to have challenging coals, which I can't deal with, or are going to require water, which my system needs, but the country doesn't have available in the, the quantities that I would like to use. It might not have the raw materials I want. And so there are certain plants that are going to be excluded. Almost 50% of the plants in Colbania are now excluded from my sale pot because of um, reasons that are technologically not applicable or appropriate. So, okay, 50 plants are left. I'm going to make 50 sales. Unfortunately, or fortunately for the Colbanian people, the Colbanian government um, gives priority in tenders to local Colbanian businesses. And, understandably, the Colbanian people know their coals, they know their emission limits, and um, they're better at producing a system to suit them. Yes, they may have copied my Mercury Be Gone system a little bit, but they're mass producing it at half the cost to sell to their marketplace. There will be not this um, company that's just kind of borrowed my technology may not be able to produce all 50 technologies for the plant. So there is a small marketplace. But those remaining 20 plants that are leaching out into the national and international market for the control technology are going to be looking nationally and internationally. And so I have to fight alongside 20, 30 other suppliers who believe their tech is better than mine. And so this is why the market isn't equivalent to the legislation. Now, finally, getting on to the country stuff. Uh, apologize to those of you who've been waiting for this bit. Um, as I say, this is transient information. I'm just going to give you some pointers. It's, it's not a prescription. This is what I picked up from the uh, ITA. Um, there's not much out there on markets, and the ITA is actually a very good source. I recommend you go in and read that document you can access through the, my report. It gives an idea of potential markets emerging for air emission technologies. Now, this is all in air emission technologies, so this is from industry and all sorts of sources. So it's not just coal-fired power plants, hence you, you'll see a couple of countries on there that don't have coal-fired power popping up. But it does give an idea of the countries that are moving, they're growing, they're looking into emissions control, and a few of the countries that appear on the list are the, the countries that I do pick on in the report. Now, let's get the USA out of the way because they're not an emerging market, but people are curious as to what they're doing. Now, I was in a meeting at the US EPA headquarters um, in North Carolina in December, just as Trump was announcing potential changes. And as you can imagine, there was um, quite volatile and justifiable concern about potential radical changes that might happen to, that would affect um, existing and impending policy in the USA. However, having said that, I was surprised that the general consensus was that most plants in the USA are already in compliance with existing and even with impending legislation. And so most plants have already done what they were planning to do to comply with MATS and so on. And those that haven't have already signed the contracts or already got the plan in place and are very likely to continue and complete those plans. And so the Trump administration might want to make some big changes but as far as we can see, most of the coal-fired power plants in the USA are actually relatively clean and have controls for SOX, NOX, and mercury as well. 
That said, um, there will, of course, be a continuing market for maintenance, upgrade, repair. Um, no control technology lasts forever, but it's not going to be a huge boom market. So the USA is going to be more of a sort of exporter of the ex this expertise than an importer, that's for sure. Moving to the EU, everybody's buzzing about the potential new industrial emissions directive, and I'll get to that in a minute. Now, the EU is different from the USA in that we didn't do the trading route, so most of our plants have had control technologies on them longer than the US plants, and it's, it was more um, consistent across the whole fleet than elsewhere. At the moment, we have, um, I think, 90% of our plants have ESP, and the rest have bag houses or a combination of the both. 88% um, have FTD, most of which is wet FTD. 8% has low sulfur coal. Some of those may need to tighten that up a bit. Most plants have NOx controls, around 30% SCR. There is not much new build happening um, for coal-fired power plants in the EU just because of the, the large amount of renewable obligations and so on. Um, most of the coal building activity is happening in Poland. I believe they have five plants um, planned or underway. Greece and Germany have got one each. Poland is actually investing 12.5 billion euros over the next five to ten years in coal-fired power plants. That's upgrades, replacements, as well as retrofitting for compliance. It's important to note, as I say, this policy trumps legislation. Now, Poland should be complying with EU legislation. However, their security of energy supply is more important to them, keeping the lights on, as they say. And so there's quite a bit more derogation and delays in Poland than in some other regions in the EU. Some of these older plants may delay indefinitely until closure, while the newer plants may come along and incorporate control systems as part of the original designs. So the retrofit market is, is somewhat limited, but it's probably one of the most vibrant in, in Europe at the moment. Now, the buzz is, as I say, this new breath, the BAT reference document, um, Best Available Technology for the Industrial Emissions Directive in Europe. It's not yet decided. Um, it was supposed to be at the end of last year. It's still under discussion. But what I'm hearing is between one in seven and one in four, depending on coal type, um, micrograms per meter cubes from, of mercury emissions, which is sort of in the range of... Um, um, the US legislation, getting towards the tighter end of market control. Depends plant, age, size, um, fuel and so on. And it's ultimately at the discretion of the local and national permitting authority. So every country in Europe has to adopt it into national legislation, at which point they can make it tighter if they want to. Now the early indications are that German Environmental Protection Agency is proposing to set the emission limit of 5 micrograms per cubic metre initially within the first four years of the breath. Now, that's going to be around about 2021 to 2025. And then that would be further reduced to below one microgram per cubic meter within two to four years, which is extremely tight. That's below what we're currently seeing in the USA match consideration. This has already been challenged. There's quite a bit of hoo-ha as to whether it is actually technically feasible, especially in German lignite plants. You have to bear in mind that the U.S. legislation was based on the top 12% performing plants in the USA, which do not reflect the situation in the EU. Our lignite is very different. Our plants are, are somewhat different. And so there's going to be a bit of more of a debate as to whether um, plants in the EU can get down this far. But the German market is already beginning to buzz a little bit. There have been uh, quests sent out for information on um, oxidants and um, uh, sorbent control to get down to these um, one microgram per cubic meter limits. Um, Poland may be dragging its heels, as I said, in compliance, but SBB, which is a utility in, in Poland, has, is already testing a GORE system for combined sovereign and mercury control at full scale. Um, Bulgaria has actually tested an electron beam pilot project for SOX and NOx combined control, so there are some funky projects going in there if you're prepared to go in and speak to some of these plant managers. Romania needs um, FTD systems at several lignite plants. Um, Czech Republic is in the middle of an FTD upgrading plan um, covering 28 FTDs. Greece uh, has got a few FTDs finished with more to follow. Turkey is not yet in the EU, but it does have plans to, plans to comply, um, some FTD plans. Uh, President Erdogan, just before Christmas, revealed an investment scheme for U.S. investors to invest in um, control 
in technologies and environmental and energy projects in Turkey. It's the way you would get a returning investment, good um, interest rates, that kind of thing. So you might want to check that out if you're a U.S. company trying to get into Turkey. China. Now, China obviously has a vast fleet. It should be a big market. Um, however, it's not quite as big as it used to be. Back in the day, um, 10 years ago, it was one gigawatt of plant being built every 10 days. That's not happening anymore. In fact, um, many regions are capping or have already capped their coal use. We're seeing um, coal plants that are not quite finished, brand new ones, uh, being abandoned before they're completed. So it's, it's, it's changing quite a lot in China. Most of the plants we know are, are said to have SOX and NOx control systems in place. However, we know there are issues with performance of some of these plants. So there is still a market for SOX and NOx control for upgrading and replacement, especially now that, as we see in Table 9 here, the limits for uh, particulates and SOX and NOx are coming down to, to the tightest in the world. And um, what they aim to do, this is for um, target regions where the, the, the emission limits are really tight, uh, and for new plants, and also um, in some of the regions, newer plants have to leave, reach emission limits which are the same as gas fire plants, um, which is actually doable. They have the Wagao Chow plant, which is state of the art and super clean. So a lot of investment in, in, in heli technologies, the high efficiency low emission plants in China at the moment, and still a little bit of a market for SOX and NOx and standard control technologies. As I said, they have these new feed-in tariffs that's coming at the beginning of this week. For these ultra-low emitting plants, as they call them, with bonuses being offered for those meeting these new limits. And so we may see some more funding being available at these plants for investment on new technologies. Back in 2008, it was reported by the Chinese Academy of Sciences that the China was impressing itself into the deep clean coal technology market um, for both foreign and local. So they're planning to, to build up these technologies with the vision of eventually exporting them rather than being export importers. 41 patents over the last 20 years in clean coal technologies. Um, a lot of investment happening there. Having said that, um, they are still very keen and very interested in what the rest of us are doing. Um, we have our Mercury MEC meeting coming up in uh, at the end of uh, February in South Africa. Um, we expect only 60 delegates to attend because it's small and experts only. 20 of those coming this year are China's. Uh, coming from China, from the electricity and power companies over there. So there's certainly a buzz going on with mercury control in China. So if you're interested, come along to our MEC meeting. So China should be, could be, a big marketplace. We know that it's setting uh, emission limits tighter than anywhere else, so they're going to need the state-of-the-art control technologies. However, there are obviously considerations to take into account. Um, intellectual property. Um, Intellectual property right infringement is quite common in China. Um, I don't know that they, they, they sort of shouted to the roost, but there certainly are patent infringements happening over there. There are also very good copies which are not patent infringements. If you remember the Copac system produced by EPRI, um, which was a sort of combined hybrid ESP baghouse thing, multi-pollutant control, you could throw in sorbent and control trace elements in mercury. Um, I think they tested it at one or two plants, but I'm not sure that they ever sold it at full scale. If they did, it was only to a very small number of units. Now, the Chinese produced an ethic system, which is an enhanced fabric integrated system, which is very similar. It's just a combination of an ESP and a baghouse with enhanced control. However, the Chinese managed to produce over 30 of these and have them set up in scale, full-scale plants. That's not, I'm not implying they've installed the, the patent at all. What I'm saying is right time, right place for a, a similar type technology and your market's very different from somewhere else. Chinese are very keen on demonstration projects to show that your technology is going to be equivalent or superior to something that they have in town. And if they're going to consider it, it's going to be at your expense as far as I can see. And you may need to repeat this process in different processes. With, which have different environmental rules. Now, they do have preferential procurement. That means they prefer to buy from home. State-owned enterprises often crowd out competitors coming in from elsewhere. The Chinese government has included technologies as one of the, the strategic um, moves in the next decade to generate growth in domestic consumption and production. And so they are going to prioritise the use of Chinese technologies over international technologies. In fact, government tenders offer, often explicitly uh, express a preference for domestic bidders over foreign tenders. 
And so um, over and above that, if you have an international certification system, which sometimes we have in the EU and the USA to prove that you have a certain performance standard, that may not necessarily be recognized in China. So a lot of um, barriers to, to overcome there. And if I had any um, recommendation to give for China, I would say as soon as possible work with a Chinese company franchise it, move in there, work together with somebody, so that you can, can be considered almost as a Chinese company. And that will bypass some of these national, international um, dis disparities in the marketplace. Very quickly, um, other places in Asia, um, at the bottom there, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, they're challenging. There should be markets, but the political situation and the administration and the sort of applicable um, the, the way these the legislation is acted out in practice is more challenging than elsewhere, and I discussed that more in the report. However, what I will do for the last few slides is quickly move through what's happening in India. Now, India has decided to set norms, as they call them, that's emission standards for SOX, NOx, particulates, and mercury, which are equivalent to those seen in um, Europe and the USA. The mercury uh, emission limit is only 30 micrograms, so it's not a challenge. But the SOX and NOx limits are really quite tight especially considering very few plants in India have SOX and NOx control technologies in place and the use of coal is going to continue in India. So that's a huge amount of control technologies to be installed in order for compliance to be reached. And the, the timeline that India is aiming for, which was over the next two, three, five years, is arguably too short, but it at least indicates they're moving towards controls. So most of these plants will be required to install these SOX and DNOX equipments. All new plants will have to have it, and they'll be sort of retrofitting back over the existing fleet. The important thing to note is that India has little or no national expertise in place for this kind of uh, work. They have um, VHEL and Thermax, I believe. But other than that, there are no big companies that produce, manufacture, and distribute FGD systems. So there is a huge market potential there. The cons or the challenges you will have to face in India are the high ash coals. We always get arguments from the Indian that their coal is extremely high in ash and quite unique. 30, 40, sometimes 50, really high ash coals in some situations. Now, they're trying to bring that down and they've changed legislation on the amount of ash, but they're still high ash compared to elsewhere. And so most of the DSOX and DNOX systems that have been demonstrated in the EU and the USA, they argue have not been um, demonstrated on their coals, which is true to to some extent. And so what we need as soon as possible is somebody to go in and demonstrate that this will work on their plants. They have the challenge of water availability. It's actually been into the legislation, the maximum amount of water use. As I said, they don't have the local expertise, no manufacturer skill set. An interesting thing is that they have no monitoring systems. Because they've had no legislation for sulfates and nitrates, they don't have continuous emission monitors on their plants, and they don't do manual monitoring because they've had no need to. So they've got no idea what their baseline is. Some of the plants are telling me their emissions are already below the proposed standards. Others are saying, no, it's two, three times as much. Somebody needs to go in there, teach them how to put a same system in place, calibrate it correctly, and get some baseline data so that we know what has to be done in terms of control. Financial challenge is a huge country, and to get these these systems installed in the time frame is going to be huge. It's going to make it very expensive. And because the power demand is so high and the availability is so low, with brownouts and blackouts already being com uh, common in India, retrofitting, taking a plant offline to retrofit is a challenge. So they're going to be looking at sort of quick fix, modular, bolt on existing plant, low water, um, low cost options is what India is going to be looking at. And as soon as possible, we need to get people down there to do demonstrations on that kind of thing. We need monitoring and training and equipment standardization. We're hoping to do a project through the GEF, that's the Global Environment Facility, um, and UNEP to, to get some training happening down there. We need a better understanding of the issues of the Indian coals, especially the high ash. We need to make sure that we're not going in there and fixing it for them, that we're telling them, giving perhaps our best expertise, but giving them national skill sets and expertise, providing the technology and intellectual transfer. Some demonstration projects to prove that it works, but then step back and allow them to build a national industry to provide materials, equipment and instrumentation. And if possible, if we can, help with funding and financial mechanisms, because the cost of uh, power in India, only around 45% of it is actually paid for. The rest of it is stolen or lost in transmission. So it has to be done in an economic way that doesn't affect the, the people that actually need this electricity. So 
as I say, as I said for China, if you want to build a market in India and the market could be huge, I would recommend now to act to step up in and set up an Indian hub or franchise to work within the national market. So you're already on the ground, you're working with the Indian people and you can be seen as an almost national entity um, when it comes to bids and tenders. So to conclude, um, tightening legislation is creating an interesting global market place, but it's not a, quick, a simple correlation. Just because the, the legislation is tightening, it's not um, correlating directly with sales. It's more complicated than that, especially when you bring policy into play. Parts are only going to buy equipment when they have to, and they're going to look for lower cost options, although the caveat to that is that you will occasionally find forward-thinking utilities uh, in places that will be prepared to work with you to demonstrate something new and funky. The market is often biased towards local suppliers, and that's the only way to work around that is to kind of somehow become a local supplier. There are lots of geographical, political, technical, economic variations within each country. So there can be no simple summary of what's happening in, say, Asia as a whole. You're going to have to look on a country-by-country -country basis. And as I said before, it could change within the next three months. Nobody expected Brexit to happen. Nobody expected Trump to, to, to win. These big changes can happen on a flip of a coin, and that's going to change policy and the way things happen in each of these regions. The risk is unfortunately going to be largely on you as the supplier to prove yourself in the marketplace and to pay the cost to do so. And I'll reiterate that I believe franchising and national hubs may be the safest way to move into these marketplaces. So the key message is it's complicated. I'm sorry, but it is complicated. There's no simple route. It's a convoluted map. We can help you. I mean, you can phone me. You can read the report. If you have any short questions, I'm more than happy to answer them now or later on. Um, however, if you are interested in a short market study, then perhaps that's something we can discuss with you, and, and we'll get back to you on that. Now, before I move on to the uh, uh, questions, um, Thank you for listening. The, the next webinar from the Clean Coal Centre uh, will be available on the 22nd of February, and that is the lovely Anne Carpenter, who will be talking about water conservation in coal fired power plants. So that's overlaps somewhat with what I've been saying today. So do tune in for that. Um, if you want to download the PowerPoint, this presentation, then you can click it. I think it's just a PDF, but you can certainly download it. It'll be available later on today. Um, please do feel free to share the information. However, it would be very nice if you referenced us because we do put a lot of time and effort into these reports. Uh, um, it would be nice to have the words played on what we do. Um, as always, you can listen in this webcast as catch up later on or you can um, uh, download it and, and view it later whenever it suits you. Right, let's see if we have any questions. You've all fallen asleep. There are no questions. As I said before, my web, my email address is on there, um, leslie.sloss at iea-coal.org or leslie.sloss at gmail.com, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions by email um, or, or read the report. And I should have put a slide up, but I didn't. The MEC, the Mercury Emissions from Coal Meeting, um, which is happening in South Africa at the end of February, beginning of March. is um, It's almost full, so I should maybe not be mentioning it, but it's going to be extremely exciting. We have, as I say, lots of Chinese delegates coming to talk about mercury control, hoping that we'll run the meeting in China next year. Um, we have the VGB and other interested parties from Germany who want to find out more about the, how they can comply with this uh, extremely tight emission value that's being discussed in Germany, and we have delegates coming from India, um, from Slovenia, from Russia, um, from all over the place. It should be an extremely interesting meeting in an absolute um, uh, beautiful venue. What about IGCC plants? Um, that's a good question. I know absolutely nothing about IGCC plants, to be perfectly honest, um, so I'm not going to answer that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to email whoever sent that in and I'm going to um, get someone who knows more about IGCC to answer that question for you. What, what country criteria would you consider to implement a new technology? I'm not sure I understand that question either. What country criteria? If, okay, well, let's pretend I've set, do my Mercury be gone. I'm going to start by looking uh, to see which country has coal, uh, which country is planning to keep that coal for the foreseeable future, I'm going to look at um, how forward-thinking they are in terms of not just setting legislation but actually complying 
with that legislation. I'm going to start looking at how much they consider um, import um, technologies as compared to national. Um, and then I'm, I'm probably going to pop on a flight and I'm going to fly over there, um, find a local meeting or, or build a local meeting and chat to them about um, how open they are to testing a new technology on one of their plants. I think that's the way to go, is to stick your foot out and get your nose in there. <coughs> well, that's me at um, quarter two, so I do have to shut down. Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening in. Um, if any more questions, email me and have a lovely day. Goodbye. <laughs>